Welcome back to Sidewalk Skyline Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Rogers. And on the episode today, and also part two of this interview, you're going to meet Kelly Franklin. Kelly uh, was a child of privilege growing up in a very uh, well-to-do part of Toronto, but uh, found herself uh, in her teen years migrating to the streets and uh, living a very difficult life. We're going to hear all about that difficult life in part one. And then in part two, uh, on our next episode, uh, we're going to hear about Courage for Freedom, the organization that Kelly leads, uh, and they are hard at work to bring an end to human trafficking in Canada. Let's go to my interview now with Kelly Franklin. Before we get into the really serious topic of human trafficking, um, I think it would be good to hear your story. And uh, I, I know you, Kelly, and I know that uh, um, anytime we've had a conversation, it's usually a lot of fun. Uh, but your story is not so fun, going back to the beginning. Yeah. So why don't why don't you start there? Well. So just trigger warning for anybody that's um, been involved in any kind of abuse, domestic violence, violence against women, men, girls, or boys. I'm just going to be myself. Kev, yeah. I know you're yourself, so I'm in good company. Um, I didn't understand a lot of what happened to me when I was younger till I was a lot older. Um, I think God's got a sense of humor sometimes and helps protect us from our thinking and our memories and our experiences. So really to go back to my story, it wasn't until just before I was gonna get married at 39 when I started to have huge flashbacks to days gone by when I'd been trafficked and sexually exploited um, through my young adult years. And to go back even farther than that, I'd grown up in a really, really great home I had a great mom and great relatives and friends, but there was somebody that I lived with in my household that was sexually abusing me. Mm. And here's what I know now, because when you're that young, you have no idea that that's not normal. Mm. You only know when you're a kid what the normal is in your house, right? So I started really acting out. Um, when I was 12, I stole and drove my first car from <laughs> Toronto to London. Uh, 12 years old. 12 years old. I, was, I had ingenuity. <laughs> I think there was a little entrepreneurial in me um, from the day I hit the ground. And I just was trying to cry out, but I didn't have the words or know really what was wrong or why I was behaving this way. And everybody just thought I was a bad kid. Hmm. That, you know, with the, my parents trotted me around all across Ontario for counseling, landed me if, even at 100 Huntley Street at one point. And uh, they had a counseling center there. Yeah. Today. And yeah. so Lauren Shepard had worked with David Maines to put an amazing counseling center for youth and families in at 100 Huntley Street in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And I got to go, but the problem was they didn't understand that the person on the other side of the two-way glass, until I threw the chair through it, that was the last time we ever went. There was a two-way glass, and they had somebody as an observer on the other side? My family. Oh, you're really? Yeah. Did, and they didn't tell you that? I knew he was there. You knew, yeah. I made sure he knew I knew he was there, and that was the last time I was allowed to go visit that counselor. Right. So I kind of reconciled in myself that I had to figure it out my own way and just acting out, you know, living a double life that I got told, you know, better to be a thief than a liar. And I was having who, who to told live you that? my dad, <laughs> your dad. Yeah. And, you know, I was like, wow, you're not living what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to be a rebel. And from my young years, I had the opportunity to be around horses. 
So every time I could, I'd run away from home mm -hmm. to the ranch where I got to hang out with mm -hmm. um, some really interesting people. Um, the gentleman that ran the ranch at the time, uh, his brother was involved with the mafia in Montreal oh, and, boy. you know, some racetrack characters and film studios and a lot of bikers. But you know what? These people, they loved me. They protected me. They were good to me. And the horses started to help me heal. But in the meantime, it was like I started to get involved in a lot of criminal activities just because I found acceptance. I found acceptance with people that were living street life. Um, I found escaping in drugs and just things that were really exciting mm -hmm. helped me to forget about what was happening to me in the house. So I started doing life on the installment plan, mm -hmm. <laughs> as my mom fondly called it. And my mom had no idea and was always trying to help. And even my, I remember my friends trying to talk to my mom and they'd say, can you just help her? And my mom would say, I've had no control over her since she was 12. And this is when I was cooking crack, as, you know, cooking stuff in spoons in my back window, in my bougie community. You know, we had money. Mm -hmm. We had lots of money. Mm -hmm. And I was cooking and <laughs> my mom and dad couldn't figure out where all the spoons were in the winter. <laughs> well, they were in the snow because once they get so hot and I'd cooked up, I'd just throw the spoon in the snow. It wasn't until the spring that anybody in our family had any spoons in the drawer. So just, you know, and even looking back now, have a night. This must be odd to hear, but... How old were you then? 13. 13. 14. And what area were you living in then? In Toronto. Toronto, yeah. Yep. And I lived in a good neighborhood, mm -hmm. and I went to a good school, and I had good friends, but there was this hidden life of what was happening to me that people just would not understand. There's people that I meet today that knew my family and they're like, really? We loved your family. Yeah. They were the perfect model family yeah. on the outside. Yeah. But there was all this pain. The funniest thing is at 12, I really started rebelling. Hmm. I stopped going to getting on the bus to go to catechism school because we were Catholic growing mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. They would send me to go to catechism for my first confirmation. And we all stood at the same corner to get on the bus. Yeah. You know, we're in Toronto. Yeah. And I just decided that some kids getting on another bus looked like they were having more fun. So for a whole year that I was supposed to be going to school for catechism, I went to the Baptist church and I was stealing grape juice. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody from... The high school that knew that I was going there eventually, you know, by the time I'm like 14, 15, they were involved in ministry at the high school and they came to visit my dad to tell them what a great attender I was at the Baptist church and my dad threw the man off the porch. Oh I remember goodness. that guy to this day. Yeah. His name was Buddy Birch. I remember that name. And he had the courage to talk to my dad. Yeah. Yeah but it didn't really go well, <laughs> especially for me. I wasn't allowed to go back. And it's very funny because I intersected with one of my bus captains and he's now pastoring in London, Dave Cottrell. Hmm. And he remembers me on the bus as being the reason that he might have lost his position in helping with children's ministry. Wow. I was a going concern. Kevin. Yeah. And everybody thought... Just get Kelly away from a bad influence. Nobody understood I was the bad influence. <laughs> and so 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 you could you could go anywhere and be an influencer. That's what happened. And mm -hmm. so I learned to chameleon. So I hung out with bikers, I hung out with the guys at the farm, I learned the lingo at the racetrack. I loved the cheerleaders in our high school. Yep. I could hang out with the jocks. Yeah. The stoners would sit in my car and leave joints in my ashtray and smoke pot. Yeah. And I could hang out with the teachers and talk to them. I could hang out with executives because of 
the level of income in my house and understanding those communities. So I learned how to adapt and shift and kind of fly under the radar as a broken person. Why do, why do you think that is? Like, why, um, was it, why was it important to you to be able to um, fit into any group anywhere? Because I didn't fit. Because I didn't fit anywhere. You're going to make me cry. You know that. Well, that, okay. that's, that's my goal. I'm not going to pull a Tammy Faye Baker. I've got waterproof mascara. Oh, okay. In the okay. Yeah. So for me, the biggest thing is I didn't fit. I always thought I was stupid mm. and that nobody understood I had value. Mm-hmm. Um, even I played hockey at a high level. I rode horses at a high level. I did really well at school when I wasn't drunk or shoved in a locker because I was stoned to hide from the teachers. I was good at art. Um, I was good at organizing other people to play in sports and teams. But at the time, like through my teenage years, I never saw it. It's funny, after you know, 25 years going out back and hanging out with some girlfriends from high school, they said, we always knew you were a leader. I'm like, well, for the love of God, why didn't one of you tell me? <laughs> but yeah. I didn't know, and I didn't want to damage my mom. So I mm. didn't speak about what ha- happened. I just kept trying. I didn't realize. I realize now with all the things I do today, mm-hmm. I was inadvertently crying out for help. I was running away from home. You know, I was hanging out. I was... You know, some of the stories I could tell, they're ridiculous. You, but You told me one about uh, <laughs> uh, you were running, uh, hiding out from the cops, and they were looking for you for a long time in Toronto. And, yeah. And then where they found you? In the stables where the horses were, because if I was close the to the police. The stables for the police stables. The police horses. The police horses. So the, to run away from the police, you hid in their stable. Because it was the safest thing I knew and the yeah. closest. I didn't have any more money to run further. Yeah. I remember stealing cars at 13 and my dad catching me and me out driving him. Yeah. In, like in a getaway speed chase. And my mom telling me that he wasn't mad that I drove the car. He was mad that I out drove him. You know, it was stuff <laughs> like that. Yeah. So I learned that I could be good at being bad. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing drugs. I started dealing drugs. I started a lot of criminal activity, starting with B&Es and cars, banks, guns, (laughs) working in communities with Jamaican gang violence. That was my ex. Mm -hmm. And then working through circles that integrated Chinese mafia to... Montreal mafia to all of that stuff and I could I could filter back and forth and just chameleon into this cuz I had to fit. And I talked my way out of a lot of jail time. Wow. I knew how to put the the ponytails on and some pink lipstick and look younger than I was and play the victim from a really well-off family that somebody had let awry mm. until that didn't work anymore. Mm. And when it didn't work anymore and it caught up with me, I was such a hot mess and just messed up. And I didn't even understand what had happened to me in a lot of the things down in South Region Park, Mm -hmm. Alexandria Park, Mm -hmm. South Jane Finch, Driftwood, Eddie Stone, Malvern, like you name every area of Toronto that I should not have been in. Uh, Those are all gang areas. Uh, traditionally they were my digs I was the most comfortable there yeah when I married my husband I took him down to Kensington Park yeah walked him through Scatting Court and took him through Graffiti Alley and said you realize you're actually sitting in shooting gallery alley Mm. Graffiti Alley now in Toronto it's beautiful place to look at the art but it's where all us heroin addicts used to go and shoot yeah when you were in the midst of you know uh what what onlookers would say this this is really dangerous you know? no, I was comfortable <laughs> you were comfortable yeah they were my people yeah what what how were you able to uh you know um 
live without the fear of, you know, uh, guns and and the violence and all the things that went along with it. So what's really amazing about it is that I have a perception of what entrenched lifestyle is. Mm -hmm. It is probably one of the most positive things that I can offer when I work with police or victim services or victims or, or survivors or people that still for survival are living street life. Mm -hmm. There is a culture of that life that you become entrenched in mm. and it becomes your day to day and your normal. Yeah. And so we don't look at it like, you know, it's funny because now I have to be really careful. I don't adopt that us and them mentality, which no. the church does a really crappy job at sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. challenge a lot of church leaders. As soon as you think you're an us and them, I wouldn't, I wouldn't darken the door of your church. Yeah. Because whenever you start to think that I'm a project and that's where you get your validation from, you're not loving on me with a good heart. Yeah. You're just trying to validate yourself. So when I'm thinking about things now with what I get to do, mm -hmm. I'm like, what did this used to feel like? How did it feel? How did it feel to be overwhelmed? I remember there were these crazy women, you know, I went through jail. I did my time. I watched people die. I smuggled drugs into jail. We got locked down. I set fires. <laughs> you know, I actually have some really cool memories of jail Yeah. that taught me, wow, I was really smart. <laughs> I started business in jail. I was threading people's eyebrows by pulling thread out of my yeah. t-shirt I had figured out how to file down my toothbrush and make a needle and I could alter people's clothes and make money. Wow. But I almost got charged because that's provincial property and I'm tampering with it. Right, so. right. But I also learned this really amazing chaplain was there. His name was Tom at Metro West. And the Salvation Army chicks brought real milk, not powder milk, mm -hmm. and cookies. Mm -hmm. So I would do anything to do Bible study. Yep. And that's where it started. And it was crazy that God got a hold of me. And my whole life, I'm a Christian mutt. So I started out <laughs> Catholic. Yep. I thought I got kicked out of the Catholic church because I was thirsty during mass and tried to take a drink out of the granite bowl at the front. <laughs> and I smashed it. <laughs> and I looked up and saw 40 foot Jesus oh. with diapers bleeding and thought, how is he ever going to help me? I'm in big doo doo. Yeah. And then we stopped going to church, but I didn't know it was because my parents were divorcing or mm. struggling with their marriage. I thought I got us kicked out of Catholicism that wow. and going to the Baptist church and stealing yeah. grape juice and then get to prison and the person that was loving on us the best was the Catholic priest who had this amazing evangelical heart and just loved on us and just didn't give up on us. It was crazy. Mm. He should have. Like, we were really yeah. mean to him. And then from there, to see the things that I experienced in jail, you know, I did time with the woman that was the first to get the indeterminate sentence in Canada and did, you know, dead time with her in cells as a punishment for mm -hmm. bringing contraband into the jail, I guess. Mm -hmm. And instead of killing me, this girl embraced me and I had developed a relationship with her. And she moved on later to Kingston. She hung herself mm. because nobody understood the level, the level of pain that people have. And you yeah. know what's really funny? That's the other thing that I learned is trying to just pray away people's pain, mm. it's not going to help them with their character or their entrenched life. Right. So if you can't love them where they're at for who they are yeah. and look past anything that you're seeing to understand they are a work in progress, Yeah. well, I'm just like you whitewashed sepulcher pharisaical Mm -hmm. sepulchral spirit. I like those scriptures. Mm -hmm. You whitewashed mm -hmm. sepulcher. Yeah. You would have never been able to give me the love that God wanted me to have. You had to look past all of it. So when we can do that and not when we can have the poker face mm -hmm. 
And it doesn't matter what the smells are or the sounds are or how much smoke <laughs> we're seeing. Yeah. Or whether it's a good day or a bad day and we are just consistent. That's where I came to. Somebody did that for me. And these crazy, you know, I came out of I came out of jail. I was already pregnant. I'll let you do the math. And there was a hit out on me. Mm. So I went into hiding through Elizabeth Fry, and mm-hmm. they did a really great job of loving on me, but I couldn't trust them to keep me safe. And so I went into hiding, and I had my son, and I was living like this, this isolate, it's pre-COVID. I know <laughs> isolation, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I've, I've also been in SAG. <laughs> yeah. I know what isolation, yeah. you guys, this is not isolation. Yeah, I, probably anybody that, knows about real isolation is doing okay during uh the pandemic stuff because you're a lot freer than uh you were back in the day you develop some techniques that you just carry forward to keep your mental health well yeah so i ended up with a little baby on the run and homeless living on the streets of toronto hiding him Hmm. under my clothes for a bunch of months until i realized that I wasn't going to be able to go through winter like this. Right, right. And then just moving forward from there, I was just, you know, nobody would give me a job. I have a record. I have Mm -hmm. a record that includes weapons and some pretty severe things, which is really funny to think that when the church embraced me, I became the children's minister. (laughs) (laughs) I used to take the kids to Sunday school once I, you know, God got a hold of my life and think to myself, do they really know who's teaching the class? I'm I'm thinking of (laughs) like the the Pied Piper, you know? Oh my goodness. So there was an amazing pastor named Tom Burke and another dude named Naran Kula Thungam and Mm -hmm. they were church planters Mm -hmm. and... You know, there was some Baptist ladies before that that kept coming to my door mm-hmm. and knocking on my door because I was hermiting. I was having groceries delivered. Yeah. We never went outside the house. And they kept knocking on the door. And after, I think, 18... I, like, every swear word in the book mm-hmm. was launched at them. <laughs> and they kept coming back. And I jokingly called them Lee Press-On Christians, like the press-on nails. They all look the same with flippy hairdos. (laughs) And if I didn't look through that people, I could have thought, oh my gosh, they probably all have aprons on. Yeah. So when 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 were you convinced that this man on the cross, Jesus, was somebody that understood you, loved you, and that you could follow? When did that, (laughs) how did that happen? Well... Because it doesn't sound like <laughs> leading up, you know, through your formative good. years, like uh, there there was any comprehension of that. There were, you know, what's really funny. There's glimmers. When I yeah. look back now, I think of a girl named Carrie Carter that was trying to witness to me, or Gino Retta from TSN Sports, yeah, trying to put my drunk butt on a bus to go to. <laughs> And, you know, I've got vodka in my McDonald's when everybody else is just doing (laughs) campus life. I'm doing woohoo life with campus life. You know, like so many people, I see so many intersection points where God was there. Yeah. Jesus was there. It's just like. You just didn't recognize him. He was watching me. Yeah. (laughs) Like, I'm still here, Cap. Like, really? There's a lot of my friends that are not here. Mm -hmm. They really aren't. They, you know drugs and gangs and violence and shootings and suicides like the list is unending and so when I got to this point where I finally said to these ladies okay if I come to you if if I come with you to church because that's all they wanted me to do just come once Mm -hmm. and I would swear my head off at them and they would leave boxes of stuff outside my door I'm like, are they stupid? Do they not know who I am and what I'm capable of? Do they not know that if I open this door, I'll jack them for their purses? Hmm. That I'll find out where they live and I'll know when they're home and I will break into their houses? Well, it's interesting you talked about when you were in that 
uh, gang life, that entrenched life. Yeah. Uh, but that's what was happening with these church people, too. They had an entrenched life that said, see the best in a person. Yeah. Over, look past <laughs> the behavior. Oh, yeah, they and, did. And look at people through the eyes of Jesus. Exactly. And, and they may have been dumb as a bag of hammers sometimes. <laughs> Or naive. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Because they, in the same way that you were fearless in the midst of violence yeah. and, and greed and all the things associated with gang life, they were entrenched in the love of God. And, and I they thank were able God to they you. didn't know my world or they would have run like the Dickens. <laughs> they <laughs> really? Might have. They might have. A lot of people. Or would. not. Right. Or not. But it's really cool sometimes how God only lets us know what we need to, to operate and what we need to listen and do. Yeah. Not so many of us now would like, let's start this and let's do that. And I'm like, hmm, could we take a step back and see what God wants? And that's what these women yeah, did. They did. And so I went to church. Yeah. I said, if you, if I go to church 18th time, <laughs> so yeah, 18, great number for me. 18th time at the door. I'm like, oh, so if I come to church with you, will you leave me alone? <laughs> yes. Great. Pick me up Sunday. And this woman with her husband, two, uh, a set of twins, a, a young girl that was my son's age, and their older twin daughter and me are shoved into their truck mm -hmm. to go to a place that original, originally was out in Campbellville called Bezac. Bezac. It was a healing center. Oh, and wow. that's where this church started. Hmm. I didn't know. I was not dressed appropriately yeah. or prepared for this. Yeah. And I sniveled through all of worship. The Holy Spirit just got a hold of me. It's funny. Like, I'm a very, I'm a very drama person. Because that's my life. Everything mm -hmm. has been a larger than life story. There's nothing easy or simple. People sometimes question me and go, how could that happen? I'm like, well, when my mom was alive, you heard her. Even my, my husband, George, mm -hmm. had to say, did this really happen? And my mom's like, mm, yeah. So mm -hmm. I watched what was happening in worship. And all of a sudden, my heart was just like hurting and open and I'm leaking. And I mean, I hadn't cried for 10 years. Mm. I was, I'd shoot you as soon as I'd look at you. Mm -hmm. I'd steal from you. I could smile in your face and hurt you. Like that was who I was. Mm. And my mom never gave up on me, but she got to a point where she's like, um, you can't live with us. Mm. Cause every time we come home, everything's at the pawn shop, except what's in your brother's room. <laughs> But we're going to still love you. Mm. And that really carried me through. And that first time that I went, and these people loved on me, I thought they were nuts. I was like, you guys are crazy. Like, you have no idea who I am. Mm. But there was something about being embraced. And this family, they treated me like family. Yeah. They took me into the church and said, this is our friend, Kelly. Kelly. Yeah. Friend? Really? Yeah. Really? And just introduced me to everybody they could mm. and had us to their house for supper and took us everywhere and helped me learn to grocery shop. And I lived in isolation and fear. Yeah. And, and started to pull me out and took me to a parent child center and introduced me in community and helped me raise my son. So there was this long process where as a young girl, you lost your innocence. Yeah. You uh, were, because of the actions of somebody doing something horrendous and evil to you, it opened the door for an entrenchment in this brokenness. And for me to operate through evil. Yeah. Because I can't just blame everybody else. Initially, or wherever the cracks in in the mortar yeah. is for that spiritual. Well, you learned that system. Yes. Yeah, but then 
you get this other dramatic uh, shift point. Juxtaposition. Yeah, where now, <laughs> now you're being entrenched in God's love. grace, his love for you, uh, the acceptance of <laughs> these really nice people that, oh, yeah. that you don't understand. No. Yeah. And, and so there's, the, I mean, the, then this, this lifetime of entrenchment in the love of God is something I'm sure you're still unpacking and learning. You know what's really amazing is to look back and see it with different eyes. Yeah. Because some days I look back at things and I go, who was that? Yeah. And that's grace. That is like so much mercy and grace yeah. to be able to say, yeah, I did these things. Yeah, yeah, these things happened. Yeah, I was engaged in this. Because I, you know, when you're entrenched in that life, mm -hmm. you do harm to other people. Mm -hmm. There is mm -hmm. a lot. There was a lot of apologies. I could tell you. There was so much to do to clean up my record. Mm. And so when this started moving forward and Tom and Naran were planting churches and I got introduced to them, I can remember them motoring over to my house to pick me up and to go and do ministry with them because I'm going to yep. introduce them to people I know in community now. Yep. And one of the guys in the car said, oh, Tom, surely we're ministering in the pit of hell. And Tom <laughs> said, yeah, and she's saved. Yeah. And to just understand, he he had a gift, though. This guy, I've never seen anybody yeah. walk streets and pray like him. Mm. And I really felt like everything was genuine. I, You know, we did ridiculous things together when we planted a church in the community that I loved. Lakeshore. Yeah, and yeah. my life turned upside down. So yeah. some people that knew me thought a cult had gotten a hold of me and brainwashed me because they didn't think, including my family, because they didn't think anything could ever, ever change me, yeah, ever. Yeah. They tried everything. Mm -hmm. And I just stuck to my guns, and they saw it was real. I was doing community work, just leading people to Christ like they yeah. were popcorn. My family. So you really are a rebel. And, <laughs> yeah, I love the, being the a rebel. the greatest rebellion was that you stepped into the love of God. My biggest rebellion is that I had to, to walk with God in my story. Yeah. If I was going to disrupt the story that the enemy had created for me, yeah. I had to accept some things that were really hard to swallow Yeah. and yeah. look at some stuff and do, and you know, so I don't, I don't sell easy Christianity to anybody. I say, you know what, if you want it, it's there. And mm -hmm. I, like my husband will tell you, I ask forgiveness, not permission about prayer. Right. So if so, I see somebody and I think they need prayer, I'm like, I'm praying for you and I just go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and whatever happens, yeah. I'll apologize after. Yeah. But I'm not going to wait because somebody didn't wait for yeah. me to invite me 18 times at a door. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was horrible to those people. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember them taking the photo. I remember that woman taking the photos when I married my husband at 39. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I'd ever be married. I didn't think I'd heal. I didn't know what was in the landscape. I wanted to be gloriously single mm -hmm. and just serve God. And I was, if you ever have a chance to talk to Naran, he'll tell you I, I was the Pied Naran, Piper. Yeah. I would walk the lakeshore on Friday nights and fill the old school Vincent Massey with as many youth as I could get out. And because I had street credibility, mm -hmm. the parents and the kids and the youth, they would come. Yeah. And you know, fast forward years later in the ministry that God allowed me to watch, I just thought it was normal to end up with 350 people that never knew Jesus to all of a sudden start coming to a church and want to build it and grow it in their home community. Yeah. I thought that was all churches, Kevin. Can you see this being problematic in my future? <laughs> and I just believe the book of Acts. So I was walking around like, I look like John the Baptist, the lunatic, eating milk and honey, like on it, like eating yeah. bugs and wearing fur yeah. in the summer. Yeah. But I love it. I, and I'm still that way. You yeah. can't, I can't, I can't, I do not have to defend the story that God's given me. Mm -hmm. It's provable. Let's talk about Jesus for a minute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jesus, 
um, when he returns, uh, has an incredible horse. Oh, don't, don't. And, okay. and where's the Kleenex, Kevin? Come on, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's waterproof makeup, so I'm not worried. You and what's... so Jesus has this beautiful white horse, and horses were such a part of you being able to put some pieces yeah. together and 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 I think Jesus was with you when you were with the horses. Oh yeah. Yeah. So talk to me about horses. What difference huh. did they make in your life? Well, the first thing is is they're not the same as other therapy animals. And until I actually later in life as the old as dirt chick took some training in this to understand that they're created to navigate PTSD. I actually went as an adult to Calgary to have a conversation with Jim Marlin, who is the psychiatrist in the team for Wounded Warriors for Canada, mm. to talk about this. And it was funny, my husband and I thought about it. Wounded Warriors, that is, tell us they, about that. They navigate PTSD care for our vets returning from service. Uh. And the PTSD that survivors of human trafficking and sexual exploitation, the brain patterns that they see are equivalent to two tours of Afghanistan or mm -hmm. somebody that's been a prisoner of war. So it only made sense to me later why that attraction was there for me. They're God's creation. Yeah. They are intuitive. They mm -hmm. are sensitive. They're not prey animals like dogs are. So therapy with them is all about creating safety. Mm -hmm. And they can evaluate... Creating safety for them? Whoever's there. Yeah. If you're within a perimeter of them, mm -hmm. you're considered herd. Mm -hmm. So they will watch how you behave in the herd, yeah. what signals you're passing, what you're not showing. So very often... They're determining whether or not you're safe. And how they can keep you safe. There's always a herd boss. Wow. And they are all about f flight. So they will help you flee if it's not safe. Mm. Or they will protect you. I've watched horses encircle kids who are acting out in anger and trying to run mm. from the farm. And the kid come back and look at me and go, well, they didn't want me to leave. They're keeping me safe. Yeah. Like they just do their work. Half the time, I don't say anything when I work with the horses there, there, and girls. Un unusual mediators of God's grace, aren't they? Yeah, and yeah. Th that that's their job. And mm -hmm. like they, they sense your heartbeat 350 meters away. Yeah. And they know why your heart's beating the way it is. Or, yeah. you know, I've had girls get dropped at the end of a driveway ready to kick out the back windshield of a police car because the majority of girls I work with are minors. Mm-hmm. So they, a lot of them feel they have no control and everything's against their will until they get let out of a car at my farm. And before they even walk up the long stretch of driveway, yeah. my horses are banging on their stalls because they can feel the pain. Hmm. And they take it almost like electricity hmm. and they ground it. And that's, you know, have you ever taken your... You ever take your shoes off, Kev, and just want to touch the grass? Mm -hmm. I'll be doing that tonight when we meet outdoors. There is something about what was created for us yeah. that connects us to each other. Not in a hocus pocus. Like, no. I'm not being weird. No, no. It I'm... was it was the plan of creation. Yeah. God God designed creation to, to work well. Yeah, and I can tell you at 12, if I hadn't had horses, I wouldn't be here. Multiple times I would have taken my so life. So let's, let's fast forward then. Um, you, this uh, having horses in your life growing up, running from the cops, hiding with the horses. And then uh, at 39, uh, now you're this, um, this uh, uh, person I was who a loves minister. Jesus. I was a minister. You're a minister. I still couldn't <laughs> believe it. I know. And you married George <laughs> at, yep. at 39. Yep. And uh, so... When did now we got to talk about farm town Canada because yeah, started as this funny is such farm. a is it funny farm is that what it is funny farm ministries funny incorporated funny farm ministries okay what were we thinking and you had done some children's ministry in churches oh for at, years yeah so 
um, yeah, I, I, I imagine that kids must have loved you because <laughs> you could see through them, but you could also probably get them having more fun than they were allowed to. And getting to know Jesus at a later time in my life mm-hmm. gave me childlike faith. I feel like, you know, what scripture says is you get the years back. Yeah. So I was living like I was 20 yeah. at 40. I'm still a little ridiculous some days, <laughs> except my body reminds me. And yeah. my husband. <laughs> I I remember telling somebody, oh, I've been saved for four years. And they're like, that was 18 years ago. Like, yeah. the one thing that doing all the drugs did is give me bad math. <laughs> and it's to my credit about my age. Okay, I'm not going to complain about that. But what was really cool is, God was showing me the broken bits that if we just help them to understand how much they're loved. Mm -hmm. And so when we started Funny Farm, oh, George and I had a plan. We started a farm. We started bringing kids from the church. The Y started sending buses of kids. Big brothers, big sisters sending kids. Children's Aid was sending kids. Kids, kids, kids. And from 2007. Immersive farm experience where city kids. With meet, God. meet creation. Yeah. We had Holy Spirit camps. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We had everything. Yeah. We just, I don't know how to say no. I don't know how George kept up. Everyone in our family pitched in. Church communities pitched in. Um, people overlooked, this sounds funny, people overlooked that we were Christian mm-hmm. because of the results they saw in the kids. They always will. if. <laughs> Well, if, I did. If the if the fruit of the spirit is there, you know who's going to argue fruit. with that? More fruit. Yeah. Fruit cocktail. Yeah. Fruit four <laughs> times a day. Sorry, I love it, Cav. Yeah. So so, so the, it was the, amazing. W- the how long uh, did did was Farm Town uh, or Funny Farm? So we morphed into Farm Town Canada with some help with rebranding with George Glover because mm-hmm. he took a look at us. And went, whoa, Yeah. how many kids we have. Yeah. We're bringing teens out. He was director at, at Teen, Teen Challenge, Challenge Canada. Farm in, in Lambeth, yeah. But he was Canada. Oh, he was, yeah. And and so he mentored he him along, kinda, helped yeah. to, 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 to say this could be more. He tolerated me <laughs> is what he did. <laughs> and gave me some good yeah. advice and said, you know, well, we were having trouble because some of the kids that were high risk, high needs... The psychiatric specialist and the pediatric doctors just could not write the note. Little Johnny needs to go to the funny farm. They just, <laughs> they just, they didn't. And it was a kid originally. My husband would attest this. It was a kid originally that said, you're like the funny farm. And somebody bought us a sign that said, welcome to the funny farm. Well, that- and the government let us start out with that name. That's awesome. So then George helped us rebrand. Yeah. And we did, and we had a really good run with this, and we did lots more community work. But the tug in my heart was the gap that I was seeing in community around this issue, especially a gap for young girls. Mm -hmm. And it was in a season between, you know, 2011 to 2013, where we, we were seeing astronomical numbers of girls that were now cutting. Mm. And into depression and Mm -hmm. with suicidal ideation and running away and just nobody knowing what to do. Right. And my heart was that I also knew there were girls that were being trafficked and had nobody to trust to talk to. Yeah. Like there wasn't systems in place or things available to talk to, especially that weren't going to stigmatize their family and, right. and blame and guilt their family or the kid. Yeah. So we looked at Farm Town Canada we morphed. We did so much work between. You were getting referrals of oh like my goodness girls that were young offenders or just coming out of everything. CAS and anything. everything. Yeah, boys, girls, everybody. Yeah, we were just the catch basin for anybody that couldn't find another answer, mm-hmm. and we just didn't say no, yeah. and we just let the horses decide and let the work of being building relationship with people. Mm-hmm. Earning the right to speak into somebody's life. Yeah. That's the biggest message that I have for the church. Mm -hmm. You need to earn the right to speak into somebody's life. And even bigger, you need to earn the right to amplify their story. 
Mm -hmm. It is vitally important. So Mm -hmm. we worked with a lot of kids that just needed a lot of extra TLC and sometimes extra muscles from us. My son played football at Western. He was the gate guy. Mm -hmm. So when there was a call on the walkie talkie that a kid had gone rogue and was a runner, Mm -hmm. he was the one that had to clear 15 fences to beat him out to the road Mm -hmm. and make sure that kid didn't get hurt. We also mentored so many youth because we'd hire like 10, 15 youth in the summer. Like, you had a did, horse barn. And we had a horse barn and a whole farm and, and yeah. goats and llamas and chickens and ducks and pot belly pigs and a zebu. Yep, yep. a zebu. And, and an emu that thought it was a turkey. And everything we had had a purpose on the farm. Yeah. And, and touched kids' lives. We helped start, um, you know, cottage industry. We started a log cabin and we sold things and the kids mm-hmm. made crafts. And we had the big road signs on the highway for years that said Farmtown Canada. And then all of a sudden there was a big need in community. We'd seen almost 10,000 kids and youth through our gates between 2007 and 2013. And we just said... We have to answer this call. Mm -hmm. And I went away. Here's the problem. I went to conference. So that's Kelly Franklin. On the weekend that Kelly came to Windsor and we recorded uh, these two episodes, uh, we had her speak uh, at our Saturday night and our Sunday morning uh, church services at New Song Church. Uh, because of uh, the the season and the pandemic restrictions and all that kind of thing, uh, we've been having our Saturday night and Sunday morning service outdoors. Um, and uh, so a lot of people uh, from the neighborhood uh, will pass by, some will come and join in. And let me just tell you something that happened on the Sunday morning. Uh, when uh, we came into the church on Sunday morning, uh, our kitchen crew uh, had found a, a young uh, Aboriginal woman that had been sleeping outside uh, just around the area where we would be holding our outdoor services. So they uh, cared for her. They got her some breakfast and brought her some water. And uh, then one of the women from our church, Victoria, uh, went over to her and introduced herself and uh, just uh, befriended her. and. Uh, So as the service uh, went on, um, I uh, was up uh, singing and I I looked over different times and I could see that this young woman had her head on um, this mother figure's shoulder, Victoria, and uh, and she was crying. And, uh, but uh, she was, uh, just appeared like she was uh, in a safe environment where she knew she was loved. Partway through Kelly's message, the, uh, this young woman collapsed, fell off of her chair and uh, was laying motionless. And uh, so one of uh, the nurses and another social worker from the church uh, were able to uh, come over and, and administer Naxalone and, and uh, we called the ambulance. And, and, uh, but you know what really marked uh, that event was uh, first of all, um, Kelly uh, being there with a message about really caring uh, about uh, what people go through. And uh, the number of people through the, the days following that kept asking me, have you heard how, how that young woman is doing? None of us had ever met her before, but uh, we found out later that she was released from the hospital. And I hope that she has discovered that there are people who care. There are environments that are caring and uh, that uh, people don't judge you. Uh, people are, want to help and want to, to meet needs. So uh, I encourage you to tune in to part two of uh, my interview with Kelly Franklin. Uh, we're going to be digging into some of the harsh realities of uh, the sex trade and sex trafficking in Canada. And uh, Windsor's a border city and border cities, of course, uh, are hot spots for trafficking. So uh, please tune in again. 
and uh, you can check out uh, Kelly Franklin in the show notes to find out more about Courage for Freedom. Well, until that time, I'm Kevin Rogers, and you're listening to Sidewalk Skyline Podcast. <laughs>